opportunity to um, engage in, in dialogue. Um, so I'm gonna work my way through my notes. Uh, we'll open it up to our fishbowl and then we'll engage in class conversation. So we know that this is a speech given um, in 1964 by El, El Haj Malik El Shabazz or Malcolm X as he's more famously known as. Um, this is Malcolm post Nation of Islam. This is Malcolm trying to cultivate his organization, um, Muslim Mosque Incorporated and the organization of Afro-American unity. So some of the themes that we have in the um, in this speech, political accountability, right? So if you're gonna vote for someone, if you're going to vote for a Democrat or Republican, make sure that they're able to cash in on their promises that cause you to vote for them, right? So let's, that's um, one of the themes. Um, this notion of the Democrats and the Republicans being on two sides of the same coin, right? So we, in our political atmosphere in the United States, right, we have the two party system the Democrats and the Republicans, Malcolm argues that they really do the same thing as it pertains to Black folks, right? So whether you consider yourself a Democrat, whether you consider yourself a Republican, neither are those neither of those parties are operating in your best interests. Um, he talks about the voter suppression of 1964. Um, to me, that's a very simple contemporary analysis that we could draw, right? We're still dealing with voter suppression in 2021. You don't have to look no farther than Georgia and how they're trying to change their voter registration laws. Um, another thing for me that's really reticent is, um, and this is a more of a characteristic of Malcolm himself. And if anybody who studies Malcolm or familiar with Malcolm's story, right, this notion of truth becomes a, a pillar, if you will, of who Malcolm X is, right? And even in the speech, he tells them, you know, I'm going to tell you the truth whether you like it or not, right? And in Malcolm's life, pillar, I'm sorry, truth has been somewhat of a, of a guiding star for him, right? So he's gonna move and he's gonna make decisions based on his understanding of the truth. Also within the speech, you hear a collective notion of freedom, not just an individual notion of freedom. Um, and, and to me, this point derives from his time spent in the nation of Islam. So if you listen to the speech or if you read the speech closely or attentively, um, you'll see that there's like an apocalyptic prophecy that's tied to his speech. What do I mean when I say an apocalyptic prophecy? What does that mean? Like the end of the world type of stuff? Right. So in a sense, if the United States does not set atonement for their treatment of Black folks, this will, be, this will bring the destruction of the United States. This is where you hear this idea of a racial powder keg is more damaging than the atomic powder keg, right? So a racial issue will be more damaging than the atomic bomb being dropped, is a claim that Malcolm makes. It's part of that apocalyptic prophecy. Excuse me. Um, I mentioned his desire to set up Muslim Mosque Incorporated and also the organization of Afro-American unity. This is where this becomes important. The Muslim Mosque Incorporated was designed to serve as a spiritual apparatus for black folks, right? So this is a Muslim organization, right? But he has the afro the organization for Afro-American unity as an organization to fight for the human rights of African people. Think back to how he starts the speech. He names all of these Christian preachers and pastors who are engaged in the um, fight for civil rights, right? Then he says of himself, I'm a Muslim minister, but I'm also engaged in this um, fight for human rights, right? So we need to leave our religion in, at home. We need to relieve our, our religion in the closet, right? Our focus must be Black nationalism. This is, and this is why he created this bifurcation or this separation between the Organization for Afro-American Unity, which is the apparatus that will drive for Black nationalism, and then Muslim Mosque Incorporated for those who still want to participate in the religion of Islam. Um, he also does a, a job of highlighting the losses of the Western colonial empire, right? And this is where you got to start to see um, Malcolm's international analysis kick in. Right. He talks about how um, Vietnam was able to overthrow the United States in the war. Um, he talks about how Algeria was able to overthrow the French. Right. 
Um, so he talks about how this aspect of guerrilla warfare neutralizes the power that the Western powers think they have, right? He says they can no longer win in a, a, a fight on the ground, right? They can't, they can't deal with the black or brown rice farmer with a knife in the jungle, right? So this is, this is Malcolm being attentive to an international perspective, right? He says on the ground, there's more black and brown people than there are white people, right? So again, this is this notion of problematizing this idea of who is a minority, right? Also a reason why I will not allow us to use terms like minority to describe ourselves in this course. Um, and then he talks about, you know, the government failure, right? He says, anytime there's a filibuster, anytime there's diddly daddling going on, that's the government at play, right? And the government has failed black people. And, and, and we've seen that again, echoed in the video that we just watched, right? He says it, the government has failed black people. Even time that you're marching, singing, we shall overcome in 1964, the government has failed you, right? And to me, the next point, really speaks to the brilliance and the forth forethought and foresight of, of Malcolm X, right? He says that we've been battling this issue as a civil rights issue for quite some time now, and it has not alleviated our pain and suffering, right? What we're dealing with is a human rights issue, okay? And because of this, his task became to take the United States to the world court for human rights violations, right? And again, this is the brilliance, this is the foresight of Malcolm X, right? So again, civil rights issue. I can't go to school where I want to because you say I can't go there. I can't live where I want to because you say I can't live there. I can't eat where I want to because you say I can't eat there. These are civil issues, right? A human rights issue is not being able to drive down the street because you feel that the police may take your life, right? Think about it this way. The term, we're gonna draw a separation between the term and the organization, okay? The term, Black Lives Matter. What does that insinuate? What do they mean behind this terminology, Black Lives Matter? that they have a voice too, that for, for years, like they, the black, black lives have been seen like as a, as a minority, where they don't, where literally in the name where they don't matter, where all to them, where they are, they're just like, they're not people, according like to white supremacists, they don't, they don't, they shouldn't have the same laws, they shouldn't have the same rights as us, as white people, so. And, they want, and that phrase, Black Lives Matter, to not infer, not like infer like other races, but also like, but to bring awareness of the black people. Absolutely, thank you, Mark. So what it's saying is, it's causing it, brought, drawing attention to the fact that black lives, right, black life, not black houses, not black jobs, right, but black life is not valued at the same level as other lies within this Western context, right? So again, this terminology and this claim is not a civil rights claim, right? They're not talking about black lies being able to eat at white lunch counters. That's a civil rights issue. Correct me if I'm wrong, right? But just for the black life to matter, you're dealing with a human rights violation, right? It's strictly with a human rights issue. Even in the terminology and the phrasing, of this Black Lives Matter movement, right, is dealing with human rights issues. Right? It's picking up subtly, right, in, in, in terminology, it's picking up what Malcolm is causing us to think about, right? But where the Black Lives Matter movement fails, in my opinion, right, they're still addressing these human rights issues as civil rights issues. Somebody tell me what I mean by that, somebody besides Mark. Why, what do I mean when I say the, uh, my personal opinion, the failure of the Black Lives Matter movement is to address human rights issues at the civil rights level. What does that mean?
would it be that I guess that the Black Lives Matter protest or whatever, would it, I'm not sure what to really call it, I guess just protest in general, mm -hmm. but their goal would be that they're trying to call, they're calling for a change on how the African American people are treated. Instead, it should be, they should be calling for a change in how they're accepted or I don't know, somewhat kind along of, the lines. Kind of. Um, anybody want to help Victor out? You're, you're not wrong, Victor. You're not wrong at all. But anybody want to help him out, help um, articulate a little bit further? Can you repeat the question, please? Yeah. So I make, I'm making the claim, right? I'm making the personal claim that a misstep of, Black, of the Black Lives Matters movement is to address a human rights issue, right? How black lives are being treated, that's a human rights issue, but they're, a, they're trying to resolve a human rights issue through civil rights means. Does that make more sense for you, Gabriella? Yeah, that makes more sense. Okay. So what do I mean by that? What does that claim mean? I understand what you're saying. Like, it's a matter of human rights, not so much like, um, like you're saying, like civil rights, like, because that was for like being able to eat at certain restaurants. This is about just Black lives being valued in general and just how our system operates right now to where it's not made for Black people. Right. And so what Malcolm is asserting and what I'm getting you guys to think about, right? He says, you cannot take the criminal to a court ran by the criminal. Does that make sense, right? So what we're doing is a police killed a black man, right? Or a black woman. We're saying we need to take that individual to court and we need justice. What Malcolm is saying is this court system is tied to the very same police institution that took this individual's life. So you're not gonna find justice there because they're, they work hand in hand, right? This idea of being two sides to the same coin. So you're not gonna find justice in the court system, in the American court system, right? That's taking the criminal to the criminal court, right? The same people who are judging these criminals are the criminals themselves, right? Yes, exactly, Mark. It's like being judge, jury, and executioner all in one, is what Mark says, and he's absolutely right, right? So what Malcolm is suggesting us to think about is how do other nations address this idea of human rights violations, right? So when um, the Jews were ex experiencing persecutions, they didn't go to, to um, the Germans and say, I need justice because we're being persecuted, right? They went to the United Nations, right? And they brought the Germans to court for their inhumane actions, right? But we're still playing the civil rights game by trying to take the people who are doing the atrocities to the same people take them to court to the same people who are doing the, the atrocities at a judicial level, right? So you're not gonna get any justice with those mechanisms and with those means, okay? Um, and then we also hear a shift in Malcolm. For those who are familiar with Malcolm, right? You, you know, in his early years when he was with the Nation of Islam, he was very much against this notion of integration, right? But we hear in this speech him say, I look at those who are struggling for integration, both fight, we're both fighting for the same objective. The objective is freedom, right? But your ways of obtaining freedom is integration. Mine's is segregation. But as long as the objective is freedom, we're good. And that represents a shift in Malcolm's thinking. And then for my last point, um, the way that he ends the speech to me is reflexive of how he ends his life and, and, and his ideological space towards the end of his life, right? He talks about how um, the Americans are telling Africans in America that Africans on the continent want nothing to do with them, right? So they're trying to drive home the separation between Africans in America and be attentive to my play on words, right? Africans in America, not African Americans. Um, and they're trying to draw this line between Africans in America and Africans who reside on the continent, right? And Malcolm says, I know that's a lie. And in fact, I'm leaving 
to go to Africa to prove that lie, right? And this becomes important because you see Malcolm X, the Pan-Africanism of Malcolm X starts to come out and starts to flourish. He starts to articulate that, right? He articulates it in black nationalism, but as he gets to his later end of his life and he makes his travels throughout Africa, this black nationalist ideology that he's dealing with becomes more of a Pan-African ideology that, he's, that he begins to deal with. So um, I'll put myself on pause. We'll jump into our fishbowl. Is there anybody who wants to volunteer for the fishbowl? Uh, I definitely suggest if you have not went at the beginning of the semester, um, you, you definitely want to start going because we're getting to the end of the semester. Are there any volunteers? I'll go. OK. Uh, is there anyone else want to volunteer? All right, we might. Mark, do you want to volunteer? OK. Uh, and I'm, I'm pretty sure you're done with the semester after this one, Mark. Um, I could double check. Um, we have one more slot. Does anybody else want to volunteer? I'll go. I'm sorry, who said that? Carla? Carla, got you. Okay, thank you, Carla. And I, I, I would have to double check, but I want to say, Carla, you're probably done too. Um, so for our fishbowl, you could talk about what we discussed in the breakout rooms. Um, we could talk about what I just discussed. Uh, you could talk about the video that we just watched or anything from the reading that you find of importance. So whoever wants to start us on you. Um, I want to bring up when you when we're talking about the how you can bring a criminal in, into his own court uh, thing and being like the judge during execution. I, I brought this up too in my my breakout room when I I read uh, it said I lost the, uh, I lost I lost the part. But he Malcolm X like mentions being um if we don't take if you don't take uh, like action like now, they're either gonna resort to to violence, like the bullet in the title. It's in the ballot or the bullet. And then there's a part where he mentions if you can either go like two ways, being where the US could, what is gonna go like the easy way, where they're gonna allow like um, black people to start like getting more rights, more like more rights as the white people being able to like vote or being able to like, get the ballot, or they're gonna go to to the bullet side where they're gonna be more violent and they're gonna bring they bring like destruction towards um, towards them and not like in like in a war like like how you say like, like a nuclear bomb but like a like um, a more of a political side war where they bring I don't know it's hard to explain but oh, I got you. Um, yeah. Yeah. And to, to Mark's point, on some, if you guys want to do further research, look up how many rebellions that took place in urban cities in 1965. Even if you think back to the video that we watched, right? In 1965, a rebellion kicked off in Watts. There's a string of rebellions that happened in 1965. And this is what Malcolm was talking about when he said, if you don't choose the ballot, this will be the bullet. And his prophecy came true because the United States burned in every, almost every major city, there was rebellions because of the racial conditions. Um, was that, were you wanted to add anything else, Mark? My fault, I kind of cut you off. No, uh, as I found the thing where it says, uh, I'm not American. I'm one of 22 million black people who are the victims of Americanism. And I like, I like how he, like, in every story, there's always like two sides. There's always like the good or bad. And in this, and right here, he like goes like straight up, I'm um, victim of Americanism. So that bad guy is, Amer is America and its values. So he wants to emphasize that um, not only himself, but the other 22 million black people are victims of, the, of America, which is like supposed to be like, this great country, but instead it's been, it's like this bad guy. And yeah. Uh, that's, a, that's a really good point, Mark. And, and that is why I said, be attentive to how I phrase Africans in America, right? That's drastically different from African-Americans. Somebody tell me, what's the distinction between Africans in America and African-Americans?
Dwayne, what do you think I mean when I say, or what do you think the difference is between Africans in America and African Americans? Dwayne, you there? Who can help out? Anybody can address this question. What's the, the difference or the distinction between Africans in America and African Americans, or Mexicans in America and Mexican Americans, Filipinos in America or Filipino Americans? What's the distinction? Um, the distinction is pretty much where you were born, um, because I'm gonna use it. Um, like Mexican Americans, when you say you're Mexican American, you're assuming that you were born here. Well, you were born here, um, and that you're pretty much a branch from, like a branch. You're like not considered fully. Like if you go to Mexico and you're Amer Mexican American, you're if you go to Mexico, you're not considered Mexican, a full Mexican. You're just considered like you're actually just like you are Mexican, but just not as they are. Does that make any sense? It's really hard to explain. And and then for blacks, um, black um, African Americans, and then Amer um, Africans, when you think about Africans is from Africa, like people that come from Africa that are here. But then when you think of African Americans is a descendant of black people, you, you don't really can think of like Africa, you think of, oh, they're American, they're black people from America from a long time ago, and they just descendant from that. Okay, yes, Claudia, but really what I'm trying to do is disturb that notion, right? So when I, when, when I use that term African in America, right, I'm talking about myself. I was born in California, which is in America, right? But like Malcolm said, I'm not an American, right? And I don't consider myself an American because I don't reap the benefits of being American, right? If I was truly American, I wouldn't even have to talk about these issues. I wouldn't have to talk about my right to vote because I'm, extend I'm experiencing the benefits of Americanism, right? Um, and Malcolm famously uses this example. If, you, if everybody's at a table and everybody at the table is eating, right? And then you pull up to the table and you have a seat, but you're not eating. Yeah, you, you, you're at that table, but you're not eating, right? So yeah, you're in America, but you're not experiencing the benefits of America, right? So how American are you? So for me, at best, all we could be are African people who were born in America, African people who live in America, African people who migrated to America, right? So this is really what I'm trying to get us to be attentive to, right? Fundamentally, Fundamentally, if you're an African descendant, you're African, right? And that's what really I'm trying to get you to get at, right? So like Malcolm said, I'm not American, I'm not a Republican, I'm not a Democrat, I'm none of that shit, right? So at best, I'm an African and I'm here in America, I was born here in America, but I'm African, I'm not American. I, I, personally, I don't even like that attachment, African-American, because it's, it's an inaccurate description. Um, my fault. We still have two people on the fishbowl. Does anybody, uh, who wants to go next? I'll go next. Okay. So something that we mentioned in um, the breakout room is how the difference, the differences between the speech and the reading and how the speech had more emotion and what he was like straightforward to his point. And then in the reading, I guess you just like, um, you decide how you want to feel about it. But in the speech, you actually get to see how he's feeling and he shows emotions technically. Um, very good point, Carla. I, I, wanted, I, wanted you, I wanted to ask you this, Carla, because you brought it up. So where, what role does the audience play in helping you understand the emotion that Malcolm's conveying? How his words can impact them. Yeah. And and I'll mention this now to kind of prep you guys for next week. Um, in the Black church, and really a lot of Black, a lot of elements of Black culture, there's this notion of call and response. Has anybody heard of the term call and response? 
No, yeah. I have not. Oh. Um, no, somebody else was saying something? What was the other one? Oh, I said yes. So Dwayne, what's call and response? Um, call and response, when you talk, when you mention the church, is basically when, um, like, like repeating something and kind of um, being involved with the action of what's going on. Sometimes people do it with like um, clapping or with drums. I know it's a cultural thing um, with music, especially. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I ask for call and response. When I ask you guys to respond to questions, when I ask you to turn on your camera so I can see you, that helps me situate myself within this call and response um, tradition that's within Black culture, right? Um, what you hear from the audience from Malcolm is the call and response, the right on brother, right? Go ahead, Malcolm. Those are these elements of call and response. So when we transition next week into Martin Luther King, you're going to hear the same call and response. Um, keep in mind, we have two preachers, right? Malcolm is a Muslim minister, same thing as a preacher. Malcolm, I'm uh, sorry, Malcolm is a Muslim minister. Martin is a, is a Baptist preacher, right? But what separates them, one, of course, is their religion, but then two, their spatiality, where they're located. One, being down south, Martin Luther King, right? And then one being up north, Malcolm X. So you're gonna hear the differences in the call and response. You're gonna hear the difference in the tone and the tempo of the speech. When you get into um, Martin Luther King, it's gonna be a lot more slower, right? And I don't know how many of you guys been down south, but the pace of the south is slow, right? So the pace of his speech becomes slow. I have never been to New York, but I know that they say it's a city that never sleeps and it's very fast paced and very fast moving, right? So Malcolm, when he speaks, is very fast paced, it's very up tempo, right? So these were these these subtle differences become important. Um, all right, and we have one more for the fishbowl. Uh, yeah. Um, so I'm basically gonna go off what Carla was saying about how uh, it was better to watch the video rather than uh, read the speech yourself because when you read the speech yourself, you only get your reaction kind of. And when you watch the video, you hear Malcolm X speak and you can get his reaction. No, I mean, you get a sense of how passionate he was towards what he was saying, and you get a sense of how the audience were reacting to what was being said. And so that really just made the speech more impactful and more exciting in a way, because you can hear their laughter and their cheers. And um, we also talked about how it, could re it relates to today, because there's a lot of injustice towards people of color, including African Americans. I feel like we compare today to back when Malcolm X gave his speech, we've still faced the same, some of the same problems and it exists basically. And and people are kind of being oppressed in a way. And uh, Malcolm X wanted to convince the audience that they could have the more power as long as they unite, which is something we need to do today. Because if we unite, we can make a difference and bring equality to all. Well said, thank you. Um, so two things that you said I, I'm gonna pick up on because you're absolutely right. Um, one, the laughter, right? Like, I don't know if he gets enough credit for his sense of humor um, and the timeliness in the way that he could um, put words together. It's very poetic, um, it's very hip hop. If you think about the rhyme scheme, we say tricky dicky, right? Like that's a play on words. Um, that's not only a brilliant play on words, it, it, it's hilarious, right? Um, another thing, um, the way he's able to use a single word to cut down an authority figure, right? And it, you may have not have picked up on it, but something as simple as calling someone a cracker, right? Um, it does something to shift power dynamics, especially to be on a pulpit or in front of an audience saying these things. Because just to be real, especially in that time, it's not nothing that people don't say inside of their home, right? It, 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 was a term, it was a common term that they use to describe white folks within the home, but you don't hear that in the public sphere, right? You don't hear somebody calling somebody black, calling somebody white or cracker with white folks in the space, right? So another pillar of Malcolm, one being the truth, the other one being moving without fear. He did everything he did fearlessly, right? And those are two guiding principles of, of, of Malcolm X. 
Um, the other thing that you picked up on was how everything that he said still applies today, right? And if you think about the video that we just watched, I used the speech that was given in 1964 to talk about the political climate of 2020, right? And that speaks to how prevalent and how um, applicable his words are still today. And it also speaks to how much we did not advance, right? Um, we're, we, in the American understanding of time, we think that as time goes on, things improve, right? But we can see from looking at this particular speech and the themes of the speech, that that's not always the case. Does that make sense? Call and response. I'm asking for the response. Does that does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, so great job, everybody on the fishbowl. Um, what I will do next week, if you guys remind me, is I'll put together um, a list to letting you know who's done with the fishbowl, who has one more fishbowl, and who has none so far. So that way you guys kind of know where you're at with that. Um, what I do want to do, though, is spend the last two minutes hearing just your overall thoughts about the reading. Um, did you enjoy just um, hearing from Malcolm? Was that something that you enjoyed, something that kind of off-putting? Um, what are your thoughts on his notion of Black nationalism? Let's start there. What are your thoughts on his notion of Black nationalism? Particularly because when you hear nationalism in our time, right, it has a negative connotation. Um, for me, when you hear white nationalism, I think of the Proud Boys, I think of the Boogaloo Boys, right? Um, whatever group that had an interview on 60 Minutes last night, right? This is what I think when I hear white nationalism. Black nationalism is the same terminology, but to me, it has a different effective um, response. So what did you guys think about when you heard the term black nationalism? Well, uh, for me, kind of like how you said, I, I kind of associated at first, like how um, the white nationalism that we see today, that's what I kind of took it as. But as I started, or as I heard more of his speech and everything, well, it kind of shifted my view of it, saying that just that their overall goal is just the human life, like basic life or basic rights is what their goal is. They don't want nothing extreme. They just want the basics because they don't have it. And like how Malcolm says, they he wants to throw like religion and everything that they have to put that aside because that's not their goal. Their goal is just unite to get their basic rights, not really about religion. You know, that that's a really good point too, Victor. Um, just decide that this idea or this notion to put down, put down any differences and organize around the commonality. And in Malcolm's case, that commonality is blackness, right? Um, and, and, and to me, if you're to take this notion and apply it to our now, um, this is where I see it play out in this notion of identity politics, right? Um, and I'm going to use the Black Lives Matter movement as an example. Um, when you say Black Lives Matter, and I, for me, right, I believe that includes anyone who identifies as Black, regardless of your religion regardless of your political affiliation, regardless of your um, sexual orientation, regardless of your gender identity, regardless of any of that, right? That for me is an all encompassing term, right? So then we have the phenomenon that says, well, now we need to say that black trans lives matter, right? And to me, that does not become necessary because if you're black and you're trans, you're included into this notion of Black Lives Matter, right? Now, that does not excuse the fact that trans people have their the um, oppressions that they go through as well. That's not excluding that, right? But from a political standpoint, right? If I get pulled over, if a, a trans individual who's black gets pulled over, right? if someone who's gay and black and gets pulled over, they're not getting pulled over because they're trans. They're not getting pulled over because they're gay, right? They're getting pulled over because they're black, right? Um, and all these deaths that happen is not because of people's religions, right? It's not because of people's orientations. It's because of the color of their skin, right? 
So it would be politically astute, it would be politically intelligent to make what we're all being persecuted around the rallying cry for why we're calling for freedom, right? So, and it's not to say that we don't need to set a situation to where um, the, the, the tensions between Black folks who identify as gay and Black folks who identify as straight, I'm not saying that we don't need to address that. But right now, from a standpoint of politics, we're all being murdered because we're Black. And once we could get that resolved, then we could go into the more intricate conversations of addressing you know, how Black folks who identify as gay and how Black folks who identify as straight, how we need to relate to one another, right? But by and large, on a universal level, we're being oppressed because we're Black. So what I'm starting to understand, right, in our now, in our 2021 Black Lives Mo Movement moment, right, this notion of identity politics is beginning to divert the overall objective of saying that Black lives should matter, right, or advocating or organizing or positioning that Black lives do matter. Does that make sense? Somebody tell me what you what you think I I'm trying to say. I want to make sure that I'm communicating that effectively. So basically, from what I'm understanding is that um, the statement "Black Lives Matter" is like an umbrella term for all Black people, and breaking it down based on intersectionalities is just causing, I guess, more separation. Not to like not to not acknowledge that trans Black people are like killed at a high rate, but when you say Black Lives Matter, that already includes them is what I'm understanding. That's it. And, and, and again, I, I love the intersectionality piece, Gabriella, because you're, you're absolutely right. And it's not to disavow intersectionality, right? But it's to focus on the inclusiveness opposed to the divisions, right? And again, it's not even to say that we're not going to address the intersectionality, right? Because for that matter, we could say Black women's lives matter because at a higher rate, Black women within the Black community experience more um, oppression than Black men, right? And so we're not saying that we're going to ignore that, but right now, because we are Black, we're all being persecuted. And to be able to start to iron out these other issues that we have, we got to at least get the foot off our neck. Um, that's a, a great rephrasing of my statement, Gabriella. Thank you. Um, other thoughts? I'm curious to hear what you guys thought about the reading or the video um, or the speech. Anything's on the table. Um, it was long. <laughs> yeah, typically long. long, bro. That's just how it goes. But it, it, I don't know. For me, at least, it didn't, it didn't feel as long hearing it as it did reading it. It seemed a lot more arduous and less yeah. entertaining reading it. Yeah, that's another, I guess, another point of view of why most like people most likely um, like it better to hear it than to read it. Because when reading it, is it like feels like you're on forever. Yeah. But for if you're like watching it, then it's like. And that was one thing that I like to bring up. He he was very like straight to the point. He was not very like. He wasn't like all. Um, I forgot the word. Like, he was sure of what he was talking about, and he wanted his audience to know like he was sure. Like he wasn't like subjective. I think that was called. Yeah. Like, that, that's a really good point. And I think a lot of that has to do with um, time, right? Um, and also location, kind of going back to that distinction between the North and the South, right? Like in New York, let's say it's a New York minute, right? So a minute is different in New York than it is anywhere else in the world. It's a New York minute. So you have to be straight to the point to be able to capture people's attention. Another thing, right, in Harlem, it would be what they call the soapbox preachers. So you would literally get a soapbox, you would stand on it and just give your speech right there in the moment, right? And so it may be the Nation of Islam, it may be um, the Hebrew Israelites, it may be the Southern Baptist preachers, it may be whatever, all these different factions that represent the black community, right? And everybody has their soapbox. So you couldn't belabor your point in that kind of context, right? You had to say your point really quick and you had to, do what you could to get people's attention. And Malcolm, because of that climate, he became very keen on the ability to give a very straight, um, concise analysis of a situation, and then also make it entertaining to where people want to hear him. So yeah, that's, that's a really good point, Mark. Who else? Along with what Mark said, um, we kind of discussed this in our uh, 
breakout room. But I would pretty much say that I think a lot of the reason why the speech was straight to the point was because of the title also. Um, the title was like super explicit and I'm not sure if someone mentioned this already, but like um, I think ballot and bullet, but ballots or bullets, right? Um, pretty much what I got from that was like, you're either gonna give us voting ballots so we can, you know, advocate for our community or ourselves, or you're going to get a retaliation with violence through bullets. And um, it's so like, it's it's something that I would I would think Malcolm X would say, um, just because like usually when I think of Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, I think of Martin Luther King as like a peaceful fighter, and then Malcolm X is like the person who retaliated with violence. So it's just so Malcolm X, I would say, and um, it's just like super straight to the point. So. When you hear a title like that, you know what it's going to be about. You know what you're going to be listening to for the next, you know, almost an hour. And um, it's very, I don't know, the whole thing's just very beneficial how it got straight to the point. And sometimes, like, people say, have speeches where they talk about a whole bunch of different things. And there's no, like, you have to kind of, like, create a thesis in your own head. But I feel like it was super easy to get a main point of what he was trying to accomplish with his speech, like, right off the bat. Yeah, that's a good point, Dwayne. Um, and like for me, right, I find myself having to look, listen to like a lot of academic lectures, right? And the direct opposite in the academic lecture, they're gonna belabor points, they're gonna go on these deviations that really don't have shit to do with what you're talking about to get you to the point, right? Whereas Malcolm's like, yo, this is the point, it's, and everything's gonna go to this point. It's not, I'm not going around, I'm not taking any detours, I'm getting straight to the point. And then also, I'm gonna give you empirical evidence to support what I'm saying, right? How is a revolution fought? A revolution requires bloodshed, right? There's no, there's no revolution that's happened that was not bloody. The American Revolution, he says, was a bloody revolution. But America has an opportunity to be the first country to engage in a nonviolent, non-bloody revolution by giving these black folks what they deserve, right? And that's your ultimatum. You either get do by, do right by us and let us cast this ballot, or you're gonna do the the alternative, which is what they call um, the the Red Summer of '65, because of all the rebellions that took place throughout the, the throughout the country in 1965. So that's a very good point, Dwayne. Thank you, man. Um, we'll get two more and we'll close it out. Isaac, I don't think we heard from you today. Yeah, uh, I liked it. I liked hearing it more because you could hear in his voice it was like um, motivational, and I think Victor said it as well. Like um, he was trying to unite everyone, and he said it from the beginning that it doesn't matter like if you have different religions or point of views, like we all need to work together, and that's what I liked about it. Indeed. All right, so let me show you guys what's up for next week. Um, we're gonna, it's gonna be another speech. It will be uh, Martin Luther King's last speech. And which you kind of going back to what Dwayne was saying, how the title of this speech sounds very Malcolm, right? And when you think about the bifurcation or the separation between Malcolm and Martin, Malcolm, Martin seems very more passive, much more nonviolent, right? Um, but what you'll find if you pay a close attention to both of these individuals towards the end of their lives, they're really on the same page and they're really going about the objectives quite the same. And that's the reason why I chose these two speeches to kind of um, compare and contrast because you're gonna hear Malcolm, I'm sorry, Martin talk about class issues, right? Workers' rights issues, poverty issues. And these are the things that you typically hear people, um, you don't typically hear presented to us when they talk about Martin Luther King, right? So I'm gonna give you the version of, of Martin that the United States really doesn't wanna deal with. And keep in mind also that this is his last speech. So that, that means something too, there's a purpose for that. Um, let me share my screen real quick and, I, and I'll point out where those are. And then um, I'll also be emailing these out to you guys on Thursday. And I believe this one also has, you can listen to it or read it. You have the option. Uh, 
Okay. Yes. So I've been to the mountaintop. Um, just listen to that. You don't have to, there's no reading with it. So there it is. There's on YouTube. I've been to the mountaintop. Um, and then kind of keep in mind too, um, do a compare and contrast from what you heard from Malcolm and what you're hearing from, from Martin, right? So keep that, that contrast in, in, the, in the back of your mind. Um, is there any questions you guys have for me?